saying that I am not Dr. York. Um, Dr. York couldn't be with us tonight. Uh, he's um, working with some health issues, um, but he'll be back in the saddle as soon as possible. And we wanted to welcome those who are here um, on the internet and folks here in the audience. My name is Tracy Hare, and uh, we have our very good friend and state representative and colleague and community member, uh, Representative Ron Russell with us here tonight. Um, so if we can give him a warm welcome. <laughs> so uh, I, I, first of all, I, I just wanna talk a little bit about Ron the person and then we'll get into logistics of the evening. We'll hear a little bit about what uh, Representative Russell has been up to uh, in Augusta. And we'll also, I have a few questions and I'm sure the audience may have some questions to ask of Ron. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about how I know uh, Ron. And it's probably really bad that I'm, we're calling him Ron, but it just feels like he's Ron to most of us, right? Um, so um, Representative Russell and I, um, we had a, uh, an encounter in my day job uh, when he called me one day in distress about a young man he had encountered who was experiencing homelessness uh, in a wheelchair, among other challenges he was facing. And I was struck, first of all, by his, his compassion just off the street. It's not common that a, a, a passerby will call you with concern. Providers call us all the time. And so I was really pleased to have that conversation and I've since gotten to know Representative Russell um, in other capacities with his um, volunteer work on Main Street, uh, Buck, with Main Street Bucksport and Bucksport Next and other groups. So it's really exciting to have our friend and neighbor and um, as our state representative. And uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit from you. The first question I have, I'd love to know what a day in the life of Representative Russell now looks like. I guess I'm still sort of figuring that out, but I can sort of tell you what it is. Uh, it seems to grow every day. But so far, uh, um, it seems to be generally ramping up in more ways than just the learning curve. Uh, so, and this particular, the 131st legislature sort of started out with a bang because on the first day of our orientation, which was back on December 7th, um, it also was the first session day, which doesn't usually happen quite that quick. And not only was it the first session day, but what was really unusual was there was a bill um, before the legislature that day, an emergency bill. Um, which I was told and that this has probably only occurred a few other times in going back quite a ways. Normally what happens is you would meet in the 1st of January and then you still wouldn't hear a bill because bills haven't been submitted. They're submitted from uh, after the election until generally in the middle of December. Uh, this year they extended it to the 30th because of the bill that came out so quickly. And that bill was, they called it an emergency heating bill. Uh, it was quite a bit more than that. And the other thing that was sort of startling was the size of it. Uh, the main state budget for the biennium, the current one that's being proposed by the governor is $10.5 billion. Um, which means that there's about uh, <clears throat> half of that spent in each of the two years. So this bill represented uh, really the better part of half a billion dollars, which was really made it unusual because that was about almost 10% of the first year's budget. Um, so we knew we were into something special. So I guess uh, it's sort of trial by fire is the way to do it. And so that, as the day progressed, there was a pretty big learning curve there because you basically had the 
orientation that lasted that morning, and I think we'd come over, had come over one other morning, the new crop of legislators. And there were quite a few of us, there were 50 plus. Um, Maine has a um, term limits law, so after four terms in either the House or the Senate, you're termed out and you either have to go to the other <coughs> branch or you have to sit out for a year. So there, there were quite a few of us in the same boat. Um, there were a few of the 50 that had formerly been aides in the legislature, so they were sort of seeing it from the other side. And what surprised me about them was that they kind of, their learning curve, it seemed hard to believe since their job had been to help legislators, uh, was kind of right there with us. It was new to them, and you would have thought that they would have sort of seen both sides, but apparently not. <clears throat> so anyway, that bill um, was brought before the House, which, and uh, there seemed to be, uh, Nobody really knew. It, it was emergency legislation, so it needed a uh, uh, two-thirds vote. If it's just a regular bill, it's a majority, and if it's emergency legislation, which means it goes into effect as soon as the governor signs it, it needs two-thirds. And is, was that the bill that addressed emergency rental assistance? It did. It had other assistance. facets to it. Um, it it added money to the LEAP program, which is emergency uh, heating oil uh, and other sources of uh, heat. Uh, it added to a couple of emergency rental programs. Uh, one in particular was a voucher program that was about to run out at the end of the year, um, which really, I had learned about that program because of the young man that Tracy talked about. Uh, that somebody had, uh, somebody in Penobscot, uh, when I knocked on a door, had mentioned him. I mean, her words were, I don't get how this can be that there's a young man who's 30 that had an accident when he was 19, car accident in Orland, um, could be in a wheelchair and out on the street. This was in October. Uh, so essentially I said to her, Look, I've been involved with the United Way, uh, now called uh, uh, the Heart of Maine United Way, because it picked up Somerset and the rest of Waldo County, uh, as a volunteer for, I don't know, 25 years. I was sort of a master pitch man for going out and helping to raise money. So it came with my background. I was good at it, too. and. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I'm also currently a member of their uh, board of directors, uh, hoping tomorrow at the board meeting to retire from that, because I've been there, I've been on for long enough. But knowing the, <clears throat> the staff up there real well, and knowing that they probably had connections, and then uh, my daughter-in-law, just formerly Jessica Gordon's married to our son Todd, she was in a similar accident at 19 with a similar injury. And she works for Alpha One in Portland, which is an agency that um, helps uh, the disabled. So, and she's very active in the community. So I volunteered to uh, have the young man call me, if you like, uh, because maybe I can give him some contacts and help. Uh, that was my first really gigantic learning experience, why probably motivated me more on the campaign, because uh, he called the next day, he was in Eastern Maine, uh, he had had some abscess on his bottom, and he had been in the Bangor homeless shelter, and they couldn't take care of it, so they sent him to Eastern Maine, and he said, I think I'm gonna be released today. Uh, <clears throat> And I said, well, where you got to go? He says, well, they won't take me back at the homeless shelter because of my medical condition. So anyway, I said, well, call me back later in the day. Uh, he did. Uh, he was out on the street. I happened to look outside. It's pouring rain. Uh, and that's what happened. The hospital 
pushed them out, ready to go. Uh, so it was sort of panic time. Jessica and I had spent the day uh, trying to find uh, housing for him. I'd called uh, Tracy and no luck. So I didn't really know what to do. I put him up in a hotel that night for a couple of nights and we worked a couple of days on it and I learned a lot about that. He was an extraordinary young man that he'd basically been homeless for a while and I don't know how he managed, but he did. So eventually, uh, through Penquist Cap, we got him one of these emergency rental vouchers and then the, uh, this was after a couple of days, we tried to find a hotel, motel in Bangor that would accept the voucher, uh, no luck. Then we started to fan out and eventually we found a place in Winterport uh, that would accept the voucher. And then kind of Jessica took over trying to find it. And some of the things I learned along the way was one, uh, people with that injury uh, get this uh, <clears throat> sort of syndrome where their legs shake uncontrollably. And according to my daughter-in-law, Jessica, and uh, this young man, there's really only two ways to control it. He chose medical marijuana because it worked really well. The other way, if you get afflicted with it, is to have an implant, which according to him and Jessica, makes you almost not functional. So it's not much of a choice. But here's the problem. He had been in some you know, housing, permanent housing, a, a home, but he got expelled because he wouldn't give up the medical marijuana and virtually every home like that is federally funded. So if it's federally funded and you smoke marijuana, you're out. So, you know, right away I'm realizing there's a lot of work and government and I probably shouldn't tell you the end of the story because there is one, but um, during the first, I'm sort of coming back around, the first caucus on that bill, which we heard that, um, you know, they had tried to get more rental assistance and it wasn't approved by the people negotiating, uh, I got a text from Jessica and the young man had passed away. So. You know, it really struck home about the whole thing, and it was alone in the motel room, and there was more to the story, but it was it was mm -hmm. hard. You know, that reminds me of, uh, I was reading some of your campaign material before the interview tonight, and um, in the Ellsworth American, you were quoted, this was during your campaign, and it just reminded me of your story right now, you said, we are lucky. I think all Mainers have a sense of fairness, equality, and justice. Sometimes we don't let each other see it, but I believe it's there. My life has given me many experiences that can help bring them to light. And so it feels like with that story that you move through <coughs> your role now, um, learning from what you've experienced in your own world, and I wondered if you could talk more about your process when you'll be facing these bills in Augusta and, and how that will work out? So um, I'll give you an example of my process. After getting uh, elected, uh, got a call from a constituent or an email. It was from Skip Greenlaw down in Deer Isle, who was a Skip. former legislator. Uh, and he is on the board of the island now closed Island Nursing Home. So he contacted uh, the senator for down there, which we share. Uh, no, Bucksport does not, but the other three towns do. Uh, and the new representative from Blue Hill and the new representative from Deer Isle. <coughs> and the senator couldn't go, uh, Nicole Grahowski, who was a wonderful young woman, oof, smart, wow. She's been a huge help, but uh, so we went to the Island Nursing Home, got a tour. It's been closed since October of 21, and heard a lot about rural low-income nursing homes. 
there have been, I don't want to get the number wrong, but either 20, since 2012, um, 20 have closed. Since 2020, uh, it was 12 of those. So, and essentially what Skip told us that day was that the Island Nursing Home had, uh, was licensed for 38 skilled nursing beds and 35 residential care beds. And essentially all the people, or almost all the people were there um, under a government program. And there are two, the skilled nursing is handled by Medicare and that would be somebody that needs skilled RN pretty much all the time. So severe dementia, Alzheimer's, something like that. And he said the reimbursement <coughs> for uh, skilled nursing care <coughs> was more than ample to cover the costs. In fact, there was some left over. But the problem with the Island Nursing Home had was skilled nursing care was not available. I've learned both there and at the legislature that that number is just under 3,000 nurses shortage. And I'm gonna show you how this reoccurs. Um, so, and he, he gave us a sort of a, a history of how they'd try to deal with it. So they got to the point um, when they closed that their rate of pay for RNs was the highest in the state. And they still could not get housing or they could not get the nurses. They thought they had a chance at some uh, nurses from the Philippines, but that fell through and so they just couldn't do it. So then time elapsed and they have what's called bed rights to those 38 and 35 beds. So with the time, with the clock ticking on those 38 beds, they sold the bed rights um, for, they're pretty valuable to a nursing home in Presque Isle. So that gave them some money to still keep somebody on staff, keep the building heated, and this was an attempt to get it reopened. And they had a very detailed plan they presented to us but the bottom line was that they really wanted those 35 beds to remain local. And they had the people waiting to move in. And, uh, but the problem was that the rate paid on the residential side, it's paid by Maine Care or Medicaid. And the rate was $96 a day. And in the 130th, they raised it to 116 and their cost when they closed was 195 and in the new proposal they got it down to 190. So they had this chunk of money from the bed rights. Um, they have an endowment but they lose it if they don't reopen uh, and they had a plan to raise three million dollars. They were going to try to raise a hundred thousand apiece from the five towns around surrounding towns and they had a capital campaign going. They'd raised about 300,000, so they had a long ways to go. And of course, they had us there to see if there was something we could do on the reimbursement rates. Um, so I did a little research after that, which is sort of my way, and I, I'm lucky because the, uh, Nina and Holly, they have small children um, and they work, and so they don't have the luxury that I have to delve into something, but I like doing that. So that was sort of my next step. So remember this word housing, because it is the buzzword in Augusta. And, and you run into it over and over. In fact, I'm on the Committee for Labor and Housing, and they've started a new joint committee, The uh, AFA, which is just a committee on affordable housing. Um, so we will not handle all that. They picked all the seasoned legislators and they're gonna do that. So I'm gonna give you an example of the way I think. And this housing issue, I just finished a three-day bus tour up to the University of Maine. We had a presentation by the healthcare providers up there. 
it, our first stop was in Bangor, and it was Northern Lights, St. Joe's, and uh, Penobscot Valley Community Health Center. You know, the, I think the most recent thing I've read is that Maine has about 25,000 units short of affordable housing as per current voucher holders. So that's folks with subsidies in hand, ready to lease up, and the housing stock is um, just not there. So at that presentation, they talked about the nursing shortage. They talked about the problem of training nurses because uh, they can't really get senior nurses to move over into the university setting because of the disparity in, in compensation, which is a problem that exacerbates it more. Um, they talked, to, and they admitted, I mean, this was pretty startling to me, and the burnout of nurses, some of the other legislators, legislators asked questions about when you drop the mandate for them needing, uh, you know, to be vaccinated, uh, <clears throat> which they pretty much said, as of now, we would wait guidance from the CDC, but not. Uh, so that had some nurses that quit. Um, some have quit just from burnout of COVID. So it was this sort of tumbling thing, and they had housing problems for nurses. So what they did admit was that care has suffered. I mean, they all of them agreed that the care in hospitals is not what it should be or could be. <clears throat> So then the tour went up to the University of Maine and then it went to its primary place, which was Washington County. And again, we heard about a shortage of nurses, yet there's health centers down there that are really trying to deal with it as best they can. Uh, and you know, they talked about things like at the Lafayette Center in Brewer, that is cancer care, how they stopped taking patients. Uh, so you had somebody down in Washington County that couldn't even be accepted there. They would have to go maybe to Portland or to someplace else. Uh, and then we went on up to uh, Princeton to the Passamaquoddy headquarters um, and some of the same themes came up. They are working feverishly to update their housing on the reservation. They gave us a lot of figures about that. So here's sort of how I think. So there's 20 nursing homes. Well, I asked a couple of questions down there. I said of the 35 people that are waiting for residential care, how many of them are in old homes that they've had and are substandard and they're having a hard time keeping them going. And his answer to me was the majority. So I went to a presentation for the Maine Housing Authority and they were sort of feeling pretty good because they provided 200 housing units last year <clears throat> and at a cost of, if I did the math right, around 400,000 apiece. Um, and yet I'm thinking, here's 20 nursing homes that closed. Let's just say that they all had 35 beds of uh, residential care times 20, that's 700. And most, many of them had homes that once they went out of would come onto the market. That sure seemed like maybe a route to go to make to fix the reimbursement rate of main care versus spending another bond on you know, trying to get 200 more next year mm -hmm. where you could get 700 just like that. Now granted, they're just gonna go onto the market but it's 200 houses on the market because they're not with these people that can't go into the residential care. So <clears throat> I guess the reason I gave that illustration is there's sort of lots of it's interconnected and you gotta sort of figure out how to deal with the pieces the best way. And then of course there's the 
the volume of bills. There were 2,100 bills submitted by legislators, senators and, and House members uh, at cloture, which is when you can stop putting in bills, and that was on the 30th of December. And those are essentially all the bills, unless it's some kind of special bill, which they said is very difficult to get, that we will see over the next two years. And Maine is very unusual. <coughs> um, virtually all of those bills, if they aren't withdrawn, will get a hearing. And the, I went on a tour today with Robert Hunt, who's the clerk of the house, pretty amazing guy, and he said that is unheard of in all the other states. It just doesn't happen. So they all get their sort of <clears throat> day before the public and the day before the committee. Has anyone in the audience been or testified at a hearing? <coughs> yeah. Has anybody in the audience ever testified at one of the committee hearings? Yeah. Do so. it. You, your legislator needs it if yeah. you're called upon. Because essentially that's where the bill gets its hope to get through. You've got to sell it. You've got to convince people that this is worthy. Um, some le new legislators on the bus tour took it as a badge of courage how many they put in. I mean, I mean there was a senator that told me he put in 80 bills. So I'm being politely prompted by, by our, our, our good friend, <laughs> Joanna, to open up to the audience uh, for questions of, of Ron. Um, so I'm sure you came loaded with good questions to ask. Um, and if you could, yeah, if we don't right. have a microphone set up. So the outcome was that night, it got passed pretty handily in the, the House. And I think what happened was the Democrats, when we caucused, they kind of told us they weren't sure what the Republicans were going to do. And it, there was plenty not to like in the bill. Uh, it distributed, and the money came from a unexpected surplus of tax revenues. And it shouldn't have been unexpected because just anecdotally, I could have told you that when we came out of COVID, things were pretty good. They certainly were pretty good in the company that I worked for before. And just in discussions in my campaign, I would ask people what they did and, and you know any kind of tradesmen or anything like that, they had work as far as they could see it. So. You know, that lull of being shut down in COVID, it's kind of, I don't want to say a boom, but things have come back very strong. So the tax revenues um, came back much stronger. So some of the money was that. And I did learn that, um, I sort of wondered why so much of it got put out in $450 checks back to taxpayers when all this other stuff that needed attention was swirling around. And my aide told me it's because sometimes extra money, it's hard to use it for a reoccurring expense. So in other, because you don't know you'll have it. So if you set up a program to pay out $20 million, but it's reoccurring, you got to get it somewhere Mm -hmm. the next biennium. Part of that bill, I think, that had a huge impact in Hancock County, it, um, it provided for a warming center to open up in Ellsworth, which w is to serve the folks who aren't accessing shelters. And so that's a, that was put to work immediately in RFP. Um, so I'll speed it up. That day, thanks to uh, I would say Saul and Millet probably more than anybody else who gave this technical, and he's an 86-year-old legislator that's held three or four commissioner jobs and all kinds. He's been in the legislature forever. He's an educator, but also a dairy farmer. He's, he's, he's been around f 
forever. And really a nice man. Uh, he got up and gave this technical speech about going around the hearing process that made sense. We shouldn't do it, but in certain circumstances we should because of this. And then he gave sort of this impassioned speech about why we should do it now. And I really think that swayed a lot of people on, say, the other side. <clears throat> and then I forget the vote. There's 151 House members, and it, I think there were only 16 against. So then what happens is you take the bill over to the Senate and they have to debate it. And, and what they did is they did this sort of maneuver that said, we're not going to skip the hearing process. And they sort of kicked the bill down the road. But they did at least do it on an emergency basis. So that was on a Wednesday. The next Wednesday, they put a special uh, appropriations committee together because it wasn't even formed yet. Committees don't come out until the middle of January. And then they had a hearing the next week and the hearing had a lot of testimony in favor and then the bill uh, came back to us with a, instead of LD1 it was LD3 and we voted on it again and not quite the same results. There's some people that it was, wasn't, there were a few more, I think there were 21 that voted against what? it. And then it went back over to the Senate and you don't really know if they're gonna well. do it or not, and they did, so. We were, um, we had 17 people facing eviction at a hotel in Ellsworth, and we found out right on the nose that they were going to be extended until April through this. Um, so, th I'm going to thank you <laughs> for yeah. voting for it. Are there any other questions? Um, and Johanna will bring the microphone to you if you have one. I can certainly ramble on about the. Oh, oh we have a question. <laughs> Hi, Ron. I've, I've talked to you personally a couple of short you times did. about the uh, landfill issue here in Bucksport. It's, it's not just Bucksport. This is a regional, statewide, a national situation. We don't know what to do with solid waste. Um, before, as you know, the landfill here in town, which was the former mill uh, site, is now being proposed to open it again and bring in statewide construction, so-called statewide construction debris, whatever that is, and some other kinds of things, incidental kinds of things, whatever that is. Um, the, I think in February there is a law that is supposed to come due in Maine that says we no longer can put out-of-state trash that is happening every day at places like Juniper Ridge, which is being bombarded as we speak with out-of-state waste. There's, um, there's supposed to be this law that comes in that is going to cover that. There, however, is already the potential for legal challenges to that. I don't know if you've heard that. I came to the meeting. Huh? I came to the meeting. Okay. So, <sighs> So we've got a, a solid waste mess, it appears. Uh, not only for Bucksport, the citizenry of Bucksport, I think, are, are pretty unanimous. They don't want this to happen. Uh, we don't want to trade poison for money, basically. That's, those are my words. I think I could back them up. Um, is you, you, I, what I heard you say, there's nothing that can be done from a legislative perspective for a couple of years because bills are already there, they're already lined up. If, <clears throat> is there any a possibility um, of really the legislature getting involved relative to solid waste, really doing a different kind of thing? really studying these. There are private people doing this now. There are people in Europe doing this now. Is there any way that 
from a legislative perspective, we can be protected, A, that we certainly don't get out of state waste, that, that, that that's, because they can't do it in their states, they do it in Maine. As, as, as I think Mr. Chapman pointed out, if you take a two by four off something, you can call it Maine waste and ship it, ship it back. And Juniper Ridge is being bought and bartered as we speak. Is there anything that you know from a legislative perspective that can dig in to the real issue of solid waste as opposed to digging holes in the ground, throwing it in, covering up, and hope it never goes away? We have multi-generational problems here. This is a, this is a monster <laughs> issue that everybody's put their head, it's, we're just burying our head in the sand and saying we'll hope for the best. I guess what I would say, Don, is uh, I, I don't know as of yet. Um, it's definitely on my mind. Uh, I came to the meeting and I listened. Um, and what I, a couple things I heard. Uh, I think the process here in town needs to play out um, as it goes forward. and it, it appeared to me, at least in that meeting, that um, that it's sort of gaining momentum, uh, not in favor, and it's being done logically and putting the pressure on AIM, which they have not come forward with any kind of cooperation at all. So just from that aspect, it didn't look like it had much for legs on it. Um, <clears throat> So as far as in general, I think one of the things, if you haven't reached out to Nicole Grahowski, she's not the senator for here in town, but this is, that is one of the things that <clears throat> I've talked with her about it a couple of times that she's very concerned about. You know, she's, and she's somebody who, she calls herself a, self-described nerd that wants to look into things so deep that it's, so I would definitely reach out to Nicole. I, I sort of showed you this, the 2100 bills, all there is is a list now, except for every time you're in session, ones that have come out of the reviser's office come across the session in the daily calendar. And right now there's probably and all that happens is they push them to the appropriate committee. And then it goes for a hearing, and then the committee goes into a work session, and then they might add amendments, they might eventually vote on it and say it ought to pass, it goes back to the legislature, it goes back and forth three times before it ever sort of gets to a vote. And then, it has to go over to the Senate and come back with concurrence so that it's there. And then eventually you sort of vote on it and then if there's what they call a fiscal note, which means there's money involved, it's gotta go to the appropriations table. And the news that I heard about that, so many of these 2100 bills are discretionary. So the governor has, put forth a budget, the House needs to make a version of that budget, and the Senate needs to make a version. And so for these 2,100 bills, there's a certain amount of money that's put on the appropriations table to take care of these bills. Now remember that $10.5 billion, which half of it is federal money, or more than half, I think. But the other day we were in a meeting and they said that money is divided equally into the four parts. The Democrats and the Republicans in the House and the Democrats and the Republicans in the Senate. Anybody want to dare guess what that total amount of money is divided by four? Any guess? For this biennium, it's $12 million three million a piece. Which, when I heard it, I was like, this can't be. I mean, there's LD-164, which is a bill I've identified that I'm very interested in because it, it proposes to bring nine million a year 
um, <coughs> to uh, do a, a lake restoration program. And I heard <coughs> on the next meeting the talk we had about Silver Lake that night from the young woman that was there. I also have had numerous contacts with the uh, Friends of Alamusic about the two dams, you know, the one at the end of Alamusic and the one at the end of Toddy Pond. And except for Verona Island, those three lakes are three quarters of the district. <coughs> so, and I was speaking to the man prior to going to this meeting and learning about the three million dollars we had to work with. That doesn't mean it can't get into the budget. But what it means is what goes into the budget <coughs> pretty much doesn't get decided on the floor as a house vote to begin with. It goes through the leadership. And they have to feel that it's an important enough issue to try to find space in that larger budget. So that doesn't mean it won't get there. That's one that I've signed on to. I've, you know, learn more about what they're trying to do. Um, it does have the support of President Jackson in the Senate. Uh, so we'll see. So what I do is these bills this morning, uh, I don't know the number, but I look at the titles and if I see a title that interests me, then I'll go look for the text of the bill and see who supports it. Sometimes it's a bill that's come before. I'll give you an example of that. I got a, an email from a constituent in Orland that wanted to talk to me about the Pine Tree Amendment. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's an amendment that very similar to the Food Amendment that says we have a right to sustainable food and this is we have a right to clean air and water in our state. I wasn't aware of it. I got online, went to their website, researched it. Um, I also read online that it had come before the 129th legislature. So you can go look up a bill and you also will see what happened in the hearing. So it'll and the hearing, not everybody brings 20 copies of written testimony. They're asked to, but just not everybody does. But the written testimony, you can see. And so it was a really long hearing because there was like pages of test people that testified. <clears throat> so I went through it and read much of the testimony until I got to and what I look for is sort of unintended consequences. So there was testimony from a hydrologist, you know, a man that does with water, and he goes right in the beginning, he said, well, I absolutely support the idea of this, but I'm also sort of trying to bring up what may happen. So for instance, uh, we treat our water in Verona because Verona is known for arsenic in its water. I don't think it was put there by anybody other than Mother Nature. And we have very hard water. <coughs> so what he said was, it doesn't say in this amendment that our water needs to meet the current EPA standards, it just needs to meet a, some unknown purity. So he said what may happen in a bill like this is somebody may take Poland Springs to task that their water doesn't meet that or that everybody that treats their water doesn't meet that and the state needs to step in and support this. So, and I did meet with her and we did talk about that and I said, you know, I, in principle I totally support this but I've got to sort of make sure that it's not, you know, something that sounds simple, but it's not simple. And if you've ever been to a committee hearing, that's what you'll find out. You'll hear all kinds of things. And so your preconceived notion of when you went there, 
maybe changes a little bit. And so I'm trying to find things that I heard about from people when I went out and knocked on doors. And I did strategize in my campaign because I had to sort of s switch people that outnumbered maybe people that were preconceived supporting me. So I pretty much only knocked on what they called conversion, uh, conversion doors. And I s said to the Democrats that asked me to run, how about if I leave it up to you to go to Democratic doors? Um, and it seemed to work. And so, you know, I wasn't exclusive, but I certainly heard a lot about a varied mix of people, what's on their mind. And I, I, I got to say a couple things about the campaign. I knocked on, I don't know, 2,500 doors. Very seldom was I asked what party I ran it, was running in. Didn't happen hardly ever. And the other thing was that I was pretty surprised that this great division that we hear about, I didn't. Um, I just listened a lot and sometimes I was nodding my head when, or things like, well, I haven't really heard it that way, but I'll certainly check. Uh, <clears throat> but in general, usually there was on even contentious issues, there was sort of a place that sounded like we could find something to agree on. So those were kind of pleasant surprises. And then the legislative process itself, if you consider yourself a wallflower, don't ever do this. Because <laughs> it's all about, you got to meet all 100 and 50 of the other legislators and you need to meet whatever it's 30 some uh, senators because it is a you know I need your help you know type of thing Are there so. any other questions for we have a couple questions Hans, Hans? Uh, But Don, I won't forget you on this. I will, when those come across, that sounds like they're interesting and I'll dig deeper too, so. And um, is, is the, at the end of this, I think we'll share how, how can um, somebody in the audience track a bill if it comes out? Um, is there, a, how to act, what's the website that you could follow along on a bill? Um, and how would one um, testify and participate in a hearing uh, on a bill? Go ahead, Hans. Um, just two things here. I'm, well, there was one thing, but I'm going to add a second one just to support what Don was saying. And I think you know where he stands and where many of us stand on this. It sounds as though what you're saying is that the legislature is pretty powerless to really move quickly or effectively on this. Um, the description you give just gives me that impression. You can counter what I'm saying. If, what, if I'm you're up. saying it doesn't move swiftly? It, 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 is, it is pretty powerless to deal with an issue like this. You've described the process of submitting bills and getting financing and the whole process. I mean, it, it, it really supports the idea that the government is pretty slow moving and ineffective in terms of dealing with current issues in town. So, am I wrong in that? Uh, I'll give you an example. So the nursing home, I, put, I only put in three bills. Uh, one of them was from a constituent that uh, thought that recreational fishermen in that out of the DMR are mm -hmm. not represented. Right. Okay, simple. And I researched it and boy, it appeared to be right. Out of 15 councils with 83 people, there was one recreational fisherman. So <clears throat> that was pretty simple. It's not going to have a physical note. Yeah. It'll just be based upon uh -huh. the, and it was the idea there used to be a recreational fishery council to reestablish it. So it's got a good shot. Uh -huh. So that went in from a constituent. It made sense to me. Uh -huh. But the next step for me, it's in but I have a meeting with the liaison at DMR to make sure that I'm not, that I'm right in just sort of my assessment. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something on the nursing home problem 
and I had made a suggestion to Skip that day, what about, I don't know really what they call it, but I call it the clawback. Hmm. And that just means if somebody goes hmm. into the nursing home and they have social security, that goes to the state, you know, the residential care. Hmm. And ultimately down the road, if they continue to stay, their house could go to the state. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, well, what about a bill to share some of that mm -hmm. clawback? Of course, it's still probably gonna get a physical note because you're mm -hmm. robbing Peter to pay Paul. Right. But then I talked to, and they, I'm in rarefied air there because I'm one of only two people that flip the seat. Mm -hmm. So, when I tell people that Amy Sylvester, she has 12 people, but, and they're all seasoned legislators, she is my aide, they're like, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. But they do it specifically because they don't want to lose this mm -hmm. seat. Yeah. I was told that. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so she suggested that it probably wasn't going to go anywhere, but to put in for a legislative study mm -hmm. committee. Because a lot of times that, that way, which does slow down the process to your point, mm -hmm. but the legislature sets aside some money, mm -hmm. which many times comes out of that three million, mm -hmm. to sort of delve mm -hmm. into real issues. Mm -hmm. And what she said, that'll give it the light of day more than you just putting in a bill that's not gonna go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, especially with ideas like I talked about, the 700, mm -hmm. quote, houses that might become available mm -hmm. uh, onto the market mm -hmm. um, versus you know, other ways to mm -hmm. get more housing. Mm -hmm. So that's how that was done. But I have noticed that, and you could look at this calendar today, that a fair number of bills go in as emergency. And if they go into emergency, it means as soon as they get through the process and are voted on, and if the governor signs it, and she can either sign it or mm -hmm. she can sign it to approve it, she can veto it, or she can just not sign it and it goes through. But it's got to have two-thirds vote. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's a hill to climb, but yeah, there's, there's certainly slowness in there, but it's pretty thorough. Mm -hmm. And to answer the question somebody had about how do I follow it, um, I don't know if you can look up the house calendar every day, but that's, I suspect you probably can. Mm -hmm. And just if you're looking for something to do in that calendar, you'll see that they're gonna bring all these bills forward and they do it very quickly. Mm -hmm. They do it in groups yeah. as to what committee it'll go to. And then just by that title, if it's there, if it's pushed to a committee, mm -hmm. you can easily go on the mm -hmm. state website and read that bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's really, they have a summary in every mm -hmm. bill and the summary really mm -hmm. gives you the gist of it. All the rest of it is definitions and mm -hmm. some of the mumbo jumbo on how mm -hmm. they label it and all that. Mm -hmm. But it's really a pretty simple process. Mm -hmm. And then eventually there'll be a hearing scheduled. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure exactly how you find that. Um, so on the main State House website, there is a list of public hearings and what committee it's in, and I, I can track that down, Joanna, and email it to you, and if folks have I can a, certainly find it, too. You could, okay, send great. It to anybody who gives me an email, or just email Perfect, it. yeah. Well, thank you, it sounds like quite a process, and I'm sure it's good in terms of filtering out crackpot legislation and so on, so it's probably necessary in a lot of cases. So anyway, I admire your willingness to take on that job for us. It yeah. Sounds kind of daunting. Well, um, I'm enjoying it. So. My, my second question had to do, and you may not be maybe too early to ask this really, but you, you did send out a link this morning to the people who were at the Bucksport Next gathering last night about some new federal designation of Down East Maine as some sort of 
protected landscape? I, I can't remember the terminology. It's I just read it a, quickly. It's uh, called National Heritage Area. That uh, has nothing to do with the legislature. That just has to do with uh, <clears throat> an email I got. I think Meg Kay actually mm -hmm. saw it first out of the omnibus bill, and it's a big deal. Could you it's, tell us a little more about it and also sure. how it would affect um, more? It sounded as though it started with the blueberry fields up there and something called Well, the, the blueberry growers started yeah. the initiative, and then and it went through the Sunrise Economic Council, and they pushed it. it. They've started. been working on it for a while. But basically, it got stuck into the omnibus bill by, it was Jared Golden and Angus King who sponsored it, and then uh, Susan Collins and... Uh, Representative Pingree co-sponsored, and they got it sort of stuck in there. Um, they've been working on it for a while. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of designation of the National Park Service. So you can have a national park, you can have what uh, the Woods and Waters is up there, which is the next step. And I'm not sure where this is in the chain, but it's called the National Heritage Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really, it's a pretty good description on the website and in those links that I sent you. But what it means is it makes available to the two counties in Maine that were designated the area, which is the 56th designated area in the United States and the only one in Maine. I'm not even sure there's another one in New England. But it's a, an area of the United States that's of historical importance in heritage industries and uh, historical sites and a, a number of criteria. And in, as a practical matter, what it means is it opens up to organizations and nonprofits in Hancock and Washington County a whole multitude of grant possibilities. And then on top of that, it becomes an accelerator on other grant opportunities. In other words, it, there's sort of an existing grant maybe you could go for, and it'll double that grant. So it's, it's going to be good. And it, basically, there's a planning process once it starts, and that happens over a course of a year or so. But once it's sort of fully in line, and that's just to get the two counties the way I understand it, sort of in sync with this, then the work begins. And so I got a, it's not in my district, but I got an email from the new uh, selectman uh, in Castine about Fort George, that she thought Fort George was owned, owed a bunch of money in the past, and she knew I was a resident from down there. So, you know, I knew I had the time, and it went to Nina that was her, and knew she didn't have a ton of time. And my first paycheck job was working on a dig at Fort George in 1965. So I went to the uh, main historical, I probably don't have it right, commission, which is a commission in the state, and researched how Fort George is down a tier from a state park, how they get money, and it's through grants. And, you know, she could have looked it up too, but, you know, but answered her question. And, but to that point, <coughs> Fort George is going to be impacted greatly by this, and the Casting Historical Society, the Bucksport Historical Society, Main Street Bucksport, it's going to open up possibilities for all of those, and cities and towns. Hey, Katrina. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about bills that would provide um, support for um, PFAS and the communities dealing with water, drinking water. But also locally, I just had a look at the um, five-year um, data from the monitoring wells at AIM Landfill. 
and PFAs showed up quite elevated in their leachate. And what I was wondering is, I, my understanding, although I'm not quite clear, is that they currently don't have the facility to treat that leachate anymore, so it gets dumped directly into the Penobscot. And if that's the case, they're dumping uh, leachate that's quite high in, PFA, in the PFAS into the Penobscot. And so how do we, is there, so it's a twofold question. One is how do we, is there, st I guess, stuff in the legislature to help support communities in dealing with, with the drinking water and contamination? And two, to hold, um, uh, how do we protect our Penobscot River and watershed from uh, companies that dump into it? Um, and you're referring to the, the existing landfill is where it's leaching out? Yes. Um, yeah, I heard that at the meeting the other night. So I think I've seen a lot of potential bills on forever chemicals. And I've marked them all on my sort of delve in a little bit. Um, of course, there was one passed in the 130th <coughs> legislature. I haven't had you know the chance to review it yet. <coughs> But again, uh, what I would suggest is try to access the House calendar every day, see which ones have come to the House that are going to be pushed to a committee, mm -hmm. and review the bill, see if it sort of looks on target, and by all means, let me know, because I'm a person of one, and I'm trying to you know, review everything that I can. I marked three today. And so. which committee, just for ease of search, which committee would it be pushed to, something like this? Uh, you've got your glasses on, so. Maybe. Oh, but they're for far distance, so I can oh. see the people, not see your document, but well, I can try. Well, here's one I starred, an act concerning home care services. Um, my mother-in-law is in her home, her husband was in their home, and I know for a fact, as long as, you know, Marilyn remains in that home, she's going to have a healthier, happier life. So I'm very interested in this. Um, I also know that of the nursing home shortage, there's waiting lists everywhere. Uh, there's people, I couldn't believe this when I learned it, there's people warehoused in hospitals. I met somebody's husband who became uncontrollable with Alzheimer's, has been in the Ellsworth Hospital for a year. And at that presentation the other day in Bangor, every one of the, both of those hospitals have people who have been there a long time. So I'm pretty sure there was one today. Uh, and I probably, if it I would look up the one that was passed last year, and I would probably try to look up uh, LD-164 because I'm not sure it's going to, which is in lakes, but <clears throat> I don't know if you can sort by, well, there's so many that are still just titles that they don't, they aren't really formed until they, they come into the legislature to be put, legislature to be pushed to a committee. So, I can ask Nicole, she's a great resource, if she knows of any activity on that. I'll So we've gotten guidance, and you need it, because there are many, many 
lobbying organizations for businesses, but also for issues. There's one for housing. I'm missing the second Zoom meeting tonight of the Children's Caucus, which I went to the first and it was great. I'd like to be involved in that, but you just have to pick because there's so many and I could show you my email box. You get invited to literally a dozen things almost a day. So and if the audience puts know your neighbor in the subject line, you can look at that first in your email box. <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of that, the, the legislative email is broken into two parts, which is just, there's one that's called legislative email and then there's one, all the stuff coming from the outside. And somehow, it seems like things penetrate both. Yeah. So it's. So we have room for uh, just a couple more questions. Are there any more questions or follow up questions? Katrina, did you have a follow up? No. So here's what I would tell you is uh, I can use all the help I can get. So, and I need, one of the things I just need to know what people are thinking about. I, <clears throat> I know the landfill is a big issue. I, that is one of my things that I'm you know, really concerned about. Uh, I actually, the bill that's sort of, of the three that's, I don't wanna say causing me trouble, but is it gonna be a challenge, is I went to the three select meetings of the three select meetings of three of the towns and went in and sat down with Sue before I went and said, you know, what's on the town's mind? What, what can I look for? And there were a couple of things that were universal, but the one that stood out was a well-intentioned bill that got passed at the very end of the last 130th legislature. And it was a bill to give relief to seniors' property taxes. And this is probably the classic bill of unintended con consequences, in fact. So it was universal for the four towns. I'm the legislator for these towns, so I felt I should try to improve it. Um, and they talked about the administrative burden on it. They talked about the escal forever escalating costs about it. And they talked about a provision which just seemed incredulous to me that it was actually in a bill. So the bill essentially, if you go down to the town office and apply, it'll freeze your property taxes. And the only eligibility for entry is that you have lived in Maine for 10 years at some point. Doesn't have to be now, it could have been previous, but as long as you can show you lived in Maine for 10 years. So you go in, you fill out the form, you have to fill it out every year, which is crazy, and you have to almost research it, the town does. So if you think of a town like Penobscot, and I'm down talking to the selectman, and then I talk to the town clerk, and she's a, you know, the whole show. She's got all the licensing and property taxes, and she's the tax collector and everything. And now the state comes in and says, well, here's this form, not only do you have to get it filled out and deal with people all year long, everybody that's 65 or older, um, but you gotta make sure you probably remind them every year so they don't lose the benefit, because if you stop, you're out. <clears throat> so let's just say that you come in and you've got an older home and you freeze your property taxes at right when you turn 65. Well, many people who are 65 you know, had the greatest generation in front of them and they might, somebody in front of them might pass away and just leave them a little bit. And then they say, well, geez, this old house been great, but maybe we'd like to have a new house uh, and it's all on one floor, and, but the old house maybe had a tax bill of $1,500 and the new one ends up being a $400,000 house and has a tax bill of $3,500. It's still $1,500. Let's say you win the lottery 
and you know you got all kinds of money and you say well the heck with it I haven't got much time left I'm 65 you know I had time to live it up I'm gonna move to Cape Elizabeth and buy a 10 million dollar house guess what your tax bill is 1500 so they actually put that in there so Caitlin Howlett the tax assessor for Bucksport when I was researching it told me she went to a Maine Municipal Association meeting, and guess who was screaming the loudest about this bill? The folks from Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth and places like that. So it, it's not even, and the growth of it because of my generation, the baby boomers, which are just, if you look at the stats, would overwhelm the towns. And there's no guarantee that the state, it did the first year, funded it, and the governor did put money in the second year to fund it, but that doesn't mean the 132nd is gonna give it a dime. So, it, you know, that looked like one that I should do, so I put it in. I went to the reviser, we kind of sketched it out with those items I just told you, and then I got a notice a couple of days ago, which I was forewarned about, that there are six similar bills. Now, what's supposed to happen next is everybody's supposed to get together and try, you only have three days to do it and put this together into one bill. And uh, two people dropped out. Uh, I guess there were only five. And there's three left. So there's me, brand new legislator, there is Representative Terry, who happens to be the majority leader of the House. It's the second highest position after the Speaker. And then the other person is Senator Vitelli, who is the majority leader in the Senate. Okay, so here I am with two of the most powerful people in the legislature. And the way it works is whoever's name is into the reviser's office first is who's going to sponsor that bill, traditionally. So there were these wild emails over the last two days, sort of all directed at me, or what's he going to do? And it's, I don't, you know, politically, if I say I want to run again, it's probably a good feather in my cap, but I don't care about that. And it's been, but it's been difficult for me to get them to just sit down with me and say, you know, how are we gonna go forward? And Representative Terry, all she did was um, submit the Maine Municipal Association's bill, which if you send in a lobbyist bill, you gotta send it in all done. So, and it approaches it a different way, which Sue Lassard suggested this is the way we ought to do it. So, all I know is that now I'm sitting in this position of trying to preserve the idea of the previous bill and make sure it goes forward and get the parts of it out. And frankly, I've sought a lot of guidance. I think I have an idea of how to do it. And maybe that's what worry, but I'll defer and let them go first. It doesn't really matter to me because there's only one sponsor and then you're a co-sponsor, but. Right. Well, we'll certainly uh, keep an eye out on that, on yeah. that um, street fight or what, you know. Well, it's not really. state. It's <laughs> yeah. just, it's sort of like, I didn't expect to find myself in well, that position. Wow, yeah. Well, thank you for that. And we, we've really come to the end of our time. So I just wanted to thank, Thank Representative Russell for uh, joining us tonight. And he was in committee at 3.30 this afternoon texting me at work um, that he was on the road headed here. I doubt that you've even been home yet. No, um, I haven't. So, um, so he drove right here, so it's even more special. I got over it a uh, little after five. But it was a great presentation. It was a presentation from the Department of Labor. And the la there were five sections, the last presenter, was on which why it's in labor I'm not sure they explained it but it was rehabilitated services for the disabled community and I particularly wanted to hear that presentation so no it was fine I stopped for some 
Yeah. Stop for some takeout yeah. at uh, Anglers. Yeah. So jeans well, away. We have some good coffee as well here. Yeah. So um, feel free to stick around for some coffee. And I think there's some cookies and water over there as well. And thank you to everybody who tuned in online. Right. This will be found on Brown Hall Community Center uh, YouTube channel as well as Facebook page after uh, the event, uh, tentatively. Uh, but those of you who tuned in live, thanks for coming. This is Brown Hall, and uh, thank you for coming in person. I'm Tracy Hare, and Dr. York, if you're watching, uh, we miss you, and uh, we yeah, wish get you well. well. Soon. Get well yeah. soon. Thank you. I should have stayed live for that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, well, can we post um, Representative Russell's it's email? Really easy. Yeah. yeah.